When it comes to World War II and jets, the list of aircraft we tend to think about is relatively short, limited most likely to the German ME262, the Heinkel 162, the Arado and perhaps the British Gloucester Meteor. But there are many jets that came into being during that cataclysmic conflict and would, in the ashes of the fighting, help herald in a new era of fighter jets. The De Havilland Vampire. Hello everyone and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I am your host Bismarck and this episode is ad-free, sponsored by my Patreons. If you like what you see today, please consider supporting our channel via Patreon or uh, PayPal as this does help me travel to museums, sort out the logistics and get this sort of content into your living room. Today we are at Klindai in Bayern, Switzerland, having a look at the De Havilland Vampire, a British jet fighter that can track its own lineage back into the Second World War. As one of the earliest jets, it stands out as an early pioneering feat of a new age. Its recognizable design makes it a favorite of many. So before we jump inside, let's explore the history of this compact but vicious flying machine. During the Second World War, experimentation with the engines had advanced enough to develop the first jet-powered aircraft, such as the German ME262 or the British Gloucester Meteor. However, while these saw some service during the war, our example certainly didn't. But much of its development was conducted during the early 1940s. Based on specification E641, a prototype of what would become the Vampire first flew in September 1943. When it first flew, it did indeed look somewhat outlandish. The engine was set directly behind the cockpit and the tailplane was set high, connected to the fuselage and the wings by two booms. The aircraft itself was low on the ground with little clearance between the uh, tarmac and the fuselage, with the Havilland essentially trying to take advantage of the lack of an air screw. The design itself largely resulted out of the considerations given to the requirements of the jet engine. The twin boom was not a popular option but seemed to fit the project. Simplified matters and there were some advantageous externalities considering the air intake needs of the aircraft which would be housed in the wings rather than going along the fuselage. However, there were concerns about weight as well as vertical and your control of the aircraft which had to be considered. Surprisingly, from a modern perspective perhaps, the aircraft featured a composite construction of metal and wood. Following the Havilland's trend out of the late 1930s, in which the company used a lot of wood, the Vampire used this around the cockpit between bulkhead 1 and 4. The cockpit itself was set nicely forward, giving a good view on the ground, and this did of course help the pilot. The placement of the engine itself allowed for heavy forward firepower as it was out of the way, and the Vampire rolled out with four 20mm cannons. Considering the shifting priorities of the RAF, it could have been possible to introduce the Vampire earlier, but it is what it is. Test pilots issued some concerns about directional stability, but responded well to the overall modifications made and considered her, well, a nice aircraft to fly, except in sharp maneuvers. She was responsive, perhaps overly so, but with little vibrations or noise uh, annoying the operator as had been the case with piston engines. The negatives were poor acceleration, which was quite a common complaint in the early jets. Uh, there was also a concern about limited endurance, an overly sensitive rudder and poor core climb and poor vision to the side and rear, partly due to a very thick canopy. The Mark 1s were first flown in April 1945, thus coming too late to see an introduction into the frontline squadrons. But the design showed a lot of promise. 
blowing part of the original specification issued by the Air Ministry out of the sky. It was the first RAF jet to clear the mythical top speed beyond 500 miles an hour. It cleared 59,000 feet in altitude and was the first jet to conduct carrier trials back in December 45. This also showed the flexibility of the aircraft being used both on land and on the sea as well being British sea vampires. A bit of trivia, in fact, the Royal Navy used the aircraft when they experimented with rubber decks on their carriers. Put forth for squadron evaluation, the aircraft saw subsequent upgrades from engine changes to pressurized cockpits. They were quickly stationed in Germany by the second tactical air force and became the first jet to be given to the Royal Auxiliary Air Force. Thus, the vampires made sure that the Royal Air Force had a solid set of jet fighters to prepare the entry into the jet age, but it also provided the first stepping stones for other nations such as Austria, Finland, Switzerland. Before that, however, the vampire went through certain changes. You can see some of these in the tailplane. There we have the horizontal stabilizer, which was lowered after fears of compressibility did not materialize. We also see an introduction of little acorns to the side to offset the instability caused by drop tanks and a shift to a more rounded vertical stabilizer and rudder. Experiments with different engines also continued, for example, the Rolls Royce Nene. Combat trials also highlighted an inability of intercepting high flying enemy jet bombers due to the lack of performance at those altitudes. But the vampire did show a general superiority in low altitude combat. The vampire itself did not see an introduction of ejection seats, except for the exception, no more on that later. But the later version, the uh, Venom, certainly did. As such, the vampire jumped uh, through the model marks quite quickly. Uh, you'll also see that throughout this time, the RAF actually changed its nomenclature. While, for example, the Mark I of the vampire still used Roman numerals, by the time the Mark III comes along, well, we've settled to our Arabic numbers right there. Therefore, throughout this time, you will see certain nomenclature changes and a certain inconsistency in the labeling of the relevant aircraft. The vampire was being pushed forward by the RAF through various spectacular displays starting in 1946. This culminated in the 1948 transit to Canada via pit stop in Iceland and then Greenland, while an American F-80 delegation was returning the favor. In any case, the Vampire had proven to be a very flexible, competitive uh, platform able to weather both winter, temperate and tropical climates with service in Canada, Europe and Southeast Asia. Yet already before this, uh, the Gloucester Meteor had essentially become the standard British interceptor and de Havilland had to ensure a future for the Vampire. They went back to the old British party trick and clipped her wings, strengthening yet reducing the wingspan by about a foot. The fighter bomber Mark V improved the Vampire and made it more versatile as a capable ground attack fighter bomber when fitted with bombs or dumpfire rockets. This version actually saw combat against Malayan insurgents and replaced the earlier vampires both in the UK and in Germany. The vampire started to come into its own and interest by foreign governments doubled. Commonwealth nations, of course, uh, such as Australia, had already conducted trials with the aircraft and uh, some countries had also fielded the de Havilland plane. But suddenly, interest came from a very unexpected corner. The first one was France, followed by Italy. Both showed an interest to field the Vampire as frontline fighters and to further their own designs, their own jet developments, by looking at the Vampire. French Vampires also served as Jacqueline Oriol's weapon of choice when she broke the woman's speed record in 51 and 52, going 508 and 531 miles per hour, respectively. She was actually a remarkable pilot, having only learned to fly jets a year before, after uh, she spent a year or two in a hospital following a severe plane crash. During that time, she apparently got bored and decided of all things to study trigonometry and aerodynamics. Well, there is a bit of motivational trivia for you. 
In any case, a string of exports followed. Egypt, Finland, Iraq, Lebanon, Norway, Sweden, even Venezuela and more. Now, I don't want to go into all the later marks of the vampire just yet, as we have a Mark VI right next to us. It is certainly something we can do in the future. However, for now, let's turn to the aircraft we have right here in Bayern. The Vampire was the first jet the Swiss ever put into service. After first coming into contact with it during a visit to the UK in 1945, Switzerland bought four Mark Ones in 1946 and the introduction of the 3,300 pounds thrust Goblin 3 engine saw the development of the Vampire FB Mark 61. This version is essentially unique to Switzerland, although it was used as the basis for the Mark 52, which was also an export variant. Initially, 85 were produced, with a second licensed production run of 100 aircraft following that. The aircraft next to me here is part of that Swiss production. The Swiss developed quite a relationship with the Vampire, only phasing it out completely in 1990. However, first used as fighters, they were then also shifted to a more dedicated ground attack role before relegation to trainer roles. Although the relationship with Vampire was generally a positive one, initially it was not without its controversy, as other piston engine aircraft were initially favored by the Swiss Air Force. Because Switzerland had only a small air force at the time and no real expertise with jets, training was difficult and thus two-seat trainer aircraft were introduced as well. These were then also used for testing of new modifications, modifications obviously being something the Swiss really like, and also phased into reconnaissance roles. The situation steadily improved and the Vampire can be remembered as the aircraft that set the foundation for the Swiss when it comes to the jet age. The Vampire has a length of 9.4 meters, a span of 11.6 meters and stands at 2.7 meters. It is powered by a single Goblin 3 engine giving a maximum thrust of 3,300 pounds. With this it can achieve a top speed of about 820 kilometers an hour and it has a range of 600 kilometers. Empty the aircraft weighs around 3,000 kilograms and it has a maximum takeoff weight of 5,800 kilograms. The plane itself is equipped with four 20 millimeter Hispano Mark V cannons holding 150 rounds each, plenty of devastation there and additional pylons for bombs and rockets can be used depending on the combat mission. The maximum payload there is around about 500 kilograms. So to get into a vampire this is a relatively easy task. Uh, you have a foot rest here which is actually spring loaded inside of the fuselage. To get it out you push the top and you pull it out with a bit of schmackes as we say in Germany and then you'll have your left foot on the footrest, you put your right foot on the wing here, uh, of course taking care not actually to place it on the air intake here but actually keep it close to the central fuselage and then you just step right in. So let's go. Now the catch releases as you place your foot on top of it and as you can see goes into the fuselage itself. Nobody has to worry about it anymore. And then you just squeeze in. And when I say squeeze, I mean squeeze. There we go. Excellent. All right, so explaining some of the bips and bobs here in this aircraft in the general cockpit layout, it's a bit cramped. Starting all the way on the bottom left, we have a little flywheel that allows us to ice the canopy. It's set in a position that is extremely uncomfortable to access, but you wouldn't use it that often, so that's not a big deal. Above that, we have the master switch, and to the right of that, we have the emergency uh, release for the gear. All the way below that, actually well out of reach, no accidents can happen here, is the landing gear lever and uh, next to that uh, is the, uh, the flap control. Going a little bit further here, we have of course the uh, throttle control of the aircraft. You press that forward to uh, obviously open up the throttle and you have a little white flywheel here where you can actually tensen up the throttle controls, you can fix it in place, which is quite nice. To the left of the throttle, you have the fuel cock lever. Below it, you have your air brakes release lever. And the wheel below the friction control is for the elevator trim. 
moving forward a little bit more here in the aircraft, we'll see some of the dials that have to do with the operation of the engine. So we have the temperature gauges and we have the RPMs of the engine, the Goblin 3. Above that we have a G-meter and slightly offset to the left, barely visible for me at this position, is a clock. Below that, all of that we have of course indicator whether the gear is uh, stored or down and locked. Again, barely visible from here, but there is a uh, also a visual indication, a light uh, indication, so it's going to make things a little bit easier. Of course, I can also switch on a couple of lamps inside the cockpit as with every cockpit. Uh, and we also have the flap, uh, flap indicator, whether they are up or down. Switching over to the right, we start first with the gun sight, which can also then be adjusted on the right with a uh, little bit of an adjustment wheel here. But above that, you will also find a compass. To the left, got a switch for the VHF, and we've got your elevator trim, the left of that. Uh, below that, we start with the dials that I can barely see. We have the speed in kilometers an hour, and below that, the altitude. And my knee is essentially obstructing it. There's, there's very little chance of me actually being able to read it. Then to the middle of that, we have the compass, and below that, we have the IFF. To the right, we have the artificial horizon and the variometer. Behind the control stick, we find the reservoir for the fuel tanks on the left and on the right-hand side. If the stick wasn't locked in place, I would it would be impossible to, to read this. To the right then we also have to turn and slip and we have a, and I have to twist my knee here to, and actually to be able to see it, we have your oxygen meter and all the way on the right we have your compressed air reservoir. Then switching over here, we've got a nice little storage bin for maps and all that good stuff. And of course, some of the electrical systems and also the uh, starter systems for the aircraft. Set above the electrical and starter system, you have a lever that allows you to uh, manually open and close the canopy. So in the Vampire, if you were a Swiss pilot, you had one advantage over all other Vampire pilots in the world. And that is that you had an ejector seat. Provided you can actually move in this cockpit, you would be able to pull these tabs right here and you'd go straight out. You'd earn a tie and you're safe, whereas other vampire pilots, well, they're not a lock. I'm not quite sure what to say about this aircraft's cockpit. Uh, it is, of course, one of the first generation jets. There are certain uh, things you have to take for granted there. It's not going to give you the same sort of comfort as modern jets or even later jets, second generation, third generation and so on. But I can see myself, especially a tall person at the time, being somewhat amiss in this cockpit. It does have its positive features. Uh, the seat does uh, polster out a little bit and it, it is relatively comfortable. The elbow freedom here is quite nice. I do have uh, easy access with the throttle. Um, I can, I think, use all switches with relative ease. But just operating this aircraft, of course, there's also to be said about pilots flying by feel, so they understand the machine by intuition, by just skill and repetition. But you always want to be in a position where you can actually read everything. In the Vampire, it does seem to be a little bit difficult overall. Being an early fighter jet, the Vampire does have its flaws, but overall, its design held fast. It was a reliable machine, a solid stepping stone, and lives on to this day with various machines remaining in flying condition. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Thank you very much for watching, and I want to thank the Musée Clandai here in Payerne, in Switzerland, for allowing us to film their exhibit. If you're interested in seeing this particular aircraft, do visit the museum, I highly recommend it. And all information, of course, is in the description below. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting us via Patreon or PayPal, as this does help us produce this sort of content and allows us to place it right into your living room. As always, please remember to share this video and have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky. I'll have to find a way of actually getting out now.